Thank you for coming. My name is Susan Knight. I work at UW Trout Lake Station. And uh, welcome to Science on Tap Manaqua. Uh, Science on Tap is an example of the Wisconsin idea, an idea that's been around since 1905, that the boundaries of the university are the boundaries of the state. Uh, we are set up to be a discussion and not a lecture and a very much of a question and answer kind of format. I'd like to remind you about our partners in Science on Tap Manaqua. First of all, we have the Manaqua Public Library, the Lakeland Badger Chapter of the Wisconsin Alumni Association, UW Trout Lake Station, UW Kemp Natural Resources Station, and of course, our hosts, the Manaqua Brewing Company. So thank you very much. A reminder that there are four ways to watch this. You can watch just as you all are right here. And uh, you can also watch live at the library. It's, uh, well, it's not exactly live, but it's live streamed at the library. And you can have um, pretzels and root beer with uh, Mary Taylor. Uh, you can also live stream it uh, at your, on your own internet, uh, on your own computer at home over the internet. So uh, if there's a time when you can't be here, then we hope that you might do that too. Uh, it is now ad-free, so it's pretty fun to watch. And also, we are archiving our uh, speakers and events, so you can watch them later. Um, uh, it takes a couple of weeks for us to get them up and ready, but you can watch them later. So, our next event is on February 3rd, uh, 2016, and microbes around us will be our topic. Uh, microbes are everywhere, and it will be with uh, Professor uh, Trina McMahon, a UW-Madison professor in um, engineering and bacteriology. Uh, tonight, though, um, we're going to talk about citizen science. Albert Einstein famously said, I have no special talent. I am only passionately curious. The passionate curiosity is what our speakers tonight are tapping into. That is, they're tapping into your curiosity. Both of our speakers tonight are highly involved in citizen science. Robert Bohannon has been involved in research on lakes, ponds, streams, and rivers for over 30 years. He's especially interested in dragonflies and in the ecology of shallow waters and ponds. For the past 15 years, his research has included citizens, especially students, teachers, and communities near schools. He encourages the public to collect their own data and develop their own research questions about local watersheds. He helps them use their own data that they've collected themselves to make local decisions about land use and policy. He's taught ecology at all levels, from teachers to graduate students to high school to elementary school students. And recently, Robert developed a um, terrific new tool, a video game to help middle school students learn about um, ecological principles. All right, so here's your trivia about Robert. It may come as a surprise to you that Robert who is a dragonfly expert, a limnologist, and an excellent teacher is A, deathly afraid of insects, <laughs> B, cannot swim, or C, hated school as a kid. Do we have a consensus? C is wrong. Poor Robert. Robert cannot swim. <laughs> Which is very, I hope he wears his life jacket. Okay. All right, now we're going to turn to Sandy Wickman. Sandy has, uh, I think many of you know her. How many here uh, are Citizen Lake monitors who know Sandy through that? Can we have a show of hands? Yes. Okay, quite a few. Look, at all, they're all over. Okay, we love Sandy. Sandy Wickman has been the Citizen Lake Monitoring Network Regional Coordinator for much of the Northwoods since 1997. If you monitor your lake, you were probably trained by Sandy. Sandy works through the Wisconsin Lakes Partnership, an amazing collaborative effort which has been going since the early 1970s. This collaboration has three strong legs. The Wisconsin DNR supplies the technical expertise and regulatory authority. Uh, UW Extension Lakes provides educational materials and programs. And local lake people and volunteers are the third part of the partnership uh, represented by Wisconsin Lakes. Sandy single-handedly represents all the legs of this amazing collaboration, providing expertise and support for approximately 500 volunteers in nine of the northernmost counties in Wisconsin. Her volunteers monitor water clarity and water chemistry on area lakes 
as well as monitoring the native aquatic plant communities and invasive species. The Citizen Lake Monitoring Network, under a couple of different names, has been in existence since 1986 and is entering its 30th year. Some volunteers have been monitoring water quality continuously since the very beginning. Sandy not only trains and supports these volunteers, but she also takes the time to nominate volunteers for special stewardship awards to make sure they are recognized for their valuable and very much appreciated work. All right, here's a little trivia question about Sandy. Sandy is incredibly talented, hardworking, and patient, but she lacks boat driving skills. Really, do not ask her to drive the boat. What happened to really drive home this fact? A, as she was approaching the pier, Sandy twisted the handle of the throttle the wrong way, so the boat sped up, and instead of slowing down, she hit the pier so hard, she pitched her companion right into Lake Manaqua. That's A. B, at the boat landing, she tried to steer the boat onto the waiting trailer so many times that the guy waiting behind her finally got into her boat and did it for her. <laughs> no, that's actually... <laughs> oh, no, okay. All right, C, while trying to arrive at a particular point in the lake using a GPS unit, she went in circles so many times trying to hit her target that her companions got seasick from the motion and the fumes, and they never let her drive again. So what is the answer? All of the above. All of the above. <laughs> Don't drive the boat, Sandy. Okay, here we are. We're going to hear from Robert first. Thank you. Thanks, Susan. Uh, you know, we would make a really good team. A limnologist that can't swim and one that can dri can't drive a boat. Uh, so, uh, yeah, thank you for, uh, for having me. Uh, this is really exciting. Uh, and, uh, and I want to tell you that uh, the work that we've been doing is, is probably the most satisfying and fulfilling of my entire career. And I think a big part of that is because the questions are coming from communities and communities are using the data. Uh, you know, I, as a grad student, because Susan and I were in grad school together, I never imagined being introduced to someone that had 30 plus years of experience. You know, if I went to that kind of talk, I would think, oh man, he's old. <laughs> uh, but anyway, here I am. Uh, so, so I'm gonna tell you a story uh, that includes dragonflies, it includes uh, ponds, especially stormwater ponds, and then uh, working with communities and how we've have we built some of those partnerships. And, um, and I'm really, really hopeful that we can tap into uh, citizen science networks uh, around the state, but especially up here, because we would really like to start piloting some of this stuff. Uh, I love poetry, and dragonflies uh, have been the subject of uh, many poems, especially Asian poems. Uh, and this is a poem by uh, Isa. Distant mountains are reflected in the eye of the dragonfly. And then one of the more famous uh, haiku poets, uh, Basho, the dragonfly can't quite land on that blade of grass. So, um, you know, dragonflies are a conspicuous feature of life around us. Uh, they, because they have an aquatic phase, uh, and then a terrestrial phase, they provide a nice link uh, between the aquatic and terrestrial communities. Uh, there are about five to 6,000 species uh, worldwide, and that's of uh, the odonata, uh, the toothed ones, uh, because they have mandibles uh, and lower lips that have teeth on them, and so that's where they get their name. Uh, but dragonflies, they're about uh, 3,000 species, worldwide, uh, and then about 300 in the U.S. Uh, so not a lot of species. Uh, and then we have about 125 in Wisconsin. Uh, that's underestimated. That estimate will go up uh, the more people we get out uh, observing, uh, because there are many counties that just haven't been covered. Uh, so I know that that number will, will go up. Uh, one of the one of the most conspicuous dragonflies, and it's common throughout the U.S., is the common green darner. And so this is the, the big one. Uh, it, it's about uh, a seven and a half uh, centimeter uh, wingspan. 
really, really fast flyer, uh, beautiful uh, green and blues on it, just darting around everywhere. Uh, and so that's one that, that we will routinely see. Uh, it's a voracious predator. Uh, basically, it's going to feed on anything that it can catch, including smaller dragonflies, damselflies, uh, mosquitoes, other flies, mayflies. Uh, it's just a voracious, a voracious predator. Now imagine about, oh, like 300 million years ago, you were wandering around and you saw a dragonfly. Well, that dragonfly would have wingspan almost as big as a red-tailed hawk. So a big critter. And they've been around for a long time. I would love to see a dragonfly like that. Uh, when I was a kid, I loved old bad science fiction movies. And there was one about a dragonfly. I preferred that to the giant spider. Uh, so uh, we, we've been focusing on dragonflies, one, because they tend to be the top predator in a lot of the ponds that we work on. So in a lot of the ponds that don't have fish or in wetlands that don't have a, a high fish population, dragonflies, the naiads or the immatures, they are typically the top predator. And so they will feed on small fish, on tadpoles, and each other. In Wisconsin, the, uh, the naiads, they go through a uh, development cycle of about a year before they emerge as adults. Uh, some of the larger species, like the green darner, they take a little bit longer. Uh, and if you go just a little bit south, where I'm from in East Tennessee, there are several species there that they have two generations per year. So climate has an effect. And one of the reasons we're interested in setting up more citizen science is they will, be, they will provide a signal about climate change, both in how long they fly and if they start to add generations, which is possible. Uh, the naiads, uh, they, they also, I think, inform science fiction. Uh, they have this really, really cool method of capturing prey. They have a lower lip that's jointed, and that lower lip can shoot out, rapid fire, grabs prey, and pulls it back in. If you remember the movie Alien with extensible jaw, I bet whoever designed that watched dragonflies for a while. Uh, so they're, they're one of the top predators, both as the larval stage uh, in the ponds and then also uh, in the terrestrial, providing uh, you know, some measure of mosquito control, fly control. They're also an important food source. Uh, we were talking at dinner and one of the saddest moments of my life, uh, it was very, very sad. I saw hundreds of dragonfly wings, individual wings, under a red-winged blackbird perch. It was so sad. It made me cry, really. I'm serious. Okay. So, so dragonflies, they're important as, as a predator, but they're also important as a food source. And it turns out the work we've been doing with citizen science, we are finding that they tell us something about the environment that's, that's much harder for us to see. Uh, it tells us stuff that taking a dissolved oxygen measurement won't necessarily tell us. It, it gives us more of a movie of what's been happening in that body of water as opposed to a snapshot. And so uh, part of what we've been doing is working with schools uh, and working with neighborhoods and public works to then develop a program where people observe dragonflies. We had to, uh, we decided we couldn't reliably do damselflies uh, because we had to catch the damselflies in a net. And uh, we really didn't want uh, people running around with nets uh, beating the aquatic vegetation back and things like that. But dragonflies, we can do identification on the wing. And uh, this is dragonflies of the North Woods. Uh, Bob Dubois, who is a DNR person up here, helped develop this. And also then there's dragonflies of Wisconsin, uh, the Leglers. Both of these are really good sources. What we have been doing with uh, the communities that we've been working with 
is we've been developing site-specific guides, so a field guide, where on one side you've got a, a photograph, and on the other side you've got a description. And so this is something that uh, people that are recording data can go out and they take this in uh, with them into the field. What's really, really satisfying about this particular research for me, and I think what sets it aside from uh, a lot of the citizen science in other states, is it's not just people collecting data and sending data to scientists. It's people using the data. And so one of the things that emerged in this community we were working in is people started seeing some of the data showing dragonflies declining. And they were declining, we thought, because some of the vegetation had been mowed right around the ponds. And so the community looked at the data, and they're trying some ponds experimentally to see what will happen if they don't mow right to the edge of the pond. And when I heard that, I was just giddy. It's like, wow, that has never happened to me in my career. People actually using the data that they help collect to make a local decision about how water is managed. Part of why I think that uh, that was able to happen was that we didn't go in as the experts with here's what you should do and here's how you should do it. We went in as a partner, as a collaborator with, hey, I'm really interested in dragonflies and I see you've got a lot of dragonflies. I think there's some interesting things going on. Here's what we're finding. What are you interested in? And one of the things that we saw, which still dumbfounds me, is that every classroom in the Verona, Wisconsin school district has curriculum built around these stormwater ponds. So teachers and administrators took the research that we were doing and started to build curriculum. And I think that's been the foothold, is anchoring the, the research and the citizen science in the schools and letting the schools be the source of expertise. I have teachers, I hope they're not watching or don't see this, that, that know almost as much about dragonflies as I do. Okay, so thank you. Oh, do I go? Okay. Uh, before I start, I would like to say goodbye to a, a good friend of ours. A lot of you live in Oneida County, and you may know Jean Hansen, the county conservationist. She passed away on Monday evening, and I just wanted to let you know she was always a great partner to us in the Department of Natural Resources and with Wisconsin Lakes, and I just wanted to say goodbye. So. And Steph is here. Um, she works with the Land Conservation Office in Oneida County. So. But now about Citizen Lake Monitoring. Uh, it will be the 30th birthday of what used to be Self-Help Lake Monitoring, and that's what I still call it. Um, but then about 10 years ago, they changed the name to Citizen Lake Monitoring. Jeff Bodie, who was our water leader in Madison at the time, said, Self-Help, it sounds like... You know, you're a bunch of addicts out there, and, and you're trying to work through your issues. So we changed the name to Citizen Lake Monitoring, but in a lot of our, our materials, and I still call it self-help just because it's a little shorter, but the idea was the same. But in 1984, um, the DNR hired Carolyn Rumery Betts, to put together a program where citizens would go out and get information about Wisconsin lakes. And when Carolyn was hired, um, she looked at some of the other programs in some of the other states, and she said she looked at Rhode Island and Illinois and Florida, who actually had a citizen monitoring program at the time. And there was one other state, I think it might have been Iowa. But um, she took the best parts of, of those programs and then started a, a monitoring protocol for Wisconsin citizens. And the idea was that, that citizens would go out and collect water clarity information, and water clarity is often a good indicator of water quality. So that was her, 
her kind of her dream and when she she put together the manuals they're very charming they were done in 1986 before we had computers and they're just little stick drawings but it's very cute and the protocol that she developed is still with us today so the idea was that volunteers would collect data and we could look at this data long term and figure out if water clarity was improving if it was declining or if it was staying the same. And I think the, the Department of Natural Resources was really forward thinking in looking at some of those lakes in southern Wisconsin and looking at the ring of development around it and then in some cases a second ring of development around it and even a third ring of development around the lakes and thinking, you know, we really need to get some baseline data on these lakes but we also need to look north. And in the late 70s and early 80s, a lot of the lakes in northern Wisconsin hadn't been developed. Um, there were little cabins on them, and people would come up for a week or a weekend. And a lot of people, resorts were still popular, and people would just stay at a resort for a week. I used to work at the Northern Air Resort at the end of the 70s, and people would just come up for the week and stay and then go home. And just as a side note, if anybody ever wanted to make a movie, they should make it about the Northern Air, because it was really a, that was like the best job I ever had. But, <laughs> but anyway, so what volunteers were trained to do in 1986 when the program started was to go out and collect actual baseline data. So this data was used to... It, it could be used 50 years from now or 60 years from now. People could look back and say, well, this is what this lake was like before we had a lot of development on it. So Carolyn, when she developed the protocol, she, it was very simple, and the idea was that thousands of people could use it. And they would use a simple tool, a Secchi disk, and many of you recognize this. It's really simple, it's inexpensive, and the idea was that thousands of people could go out and measure water clarity. And all they do is they go out to the deepest part of the lake, they lower it, and when it just disappears from view, they mark it on the surface of the water with a clothespin, and then they mark, uh, drop it a few feet further down into the water, bring it slowly back up, and when it just reappears, they mark it again on the surface of the water, they take the average of those two, and that's their Secchi disc reading. So that's the protocol that Carolyn came up with. And the idea was that using, if all the lakes followed the same protocol, you could compare Lake Mendota in Dane County to Black Oak Lake in Vilas County, and everybody would be on the same playing field. And the protocol was simple. Volunteers would go out between the hours of 10 and 2, sunny to partly cloudy day, relatively calm, and they'd go usually to the deepest part of the lake, and that's where they took their water clarity reading. So uh, for those of you who are monitoring now, that protocol was changed slightly. We monitor from 10 until 4 now. But other than that, the protocol has remained the same. And we do have four volunteers in Wisconsin who are still monitoring water clarity and water chemistry after 30 years. And I'll tell you their names, and if any of you live on a lake where you have somebody, a volunteer who's collecting water quality data, I hope you thank them, because a lot of them have been doing it for a long time, and I think a lot of people don't know they have a monitor on their lake. But um, the four volunteers who are still monitoring after 30 years are Tom Rulsey. He's on McDonald Lake in Vilas County. He lives in Three Lakes, but he monitors in Vilas County. And Kay Sharp, she's on Franklin Lake in Forest County. Uh, Bob Kirshner, he started out on Crystal Lake in Lang Lake County. Now he's on Emden in Oneida County. And we have one more. I have to look on my list. Dale Jelinski, he's on Bear Lake in Oneida County. So this water clarity monitoring, volunteers were just given little cards, a little packet of cards, and they were told to go out take a water clarity reading, and then also note the water level on the lake, whether it was high, low, or normal, normal being where the ordinary high water mark was. And then they recorded whether the water was clear or murky, and they recorded the color, whether it was blue, green, brown, yellow, or red. And with that information, 
you can tell a great deal about your water quality. So, well, there's, with water clarity, we also try to figure out what the trophic state of the lake is. And so there's oligotrophic lakes, those are nutrient poor lakes. Um, there's not a lot of algae in the water, not a lot of phosphorus, which is a nutrient that fuels aquatic plant growth and algae growth. And there's not a lot of diversity. So some of the oligotrophic lakes here in the northern part of the state are Black Oak Lake in Vilas County. They typically get secchi disc readings of 30, 32, 33 feet. They had to ask for an additional rope on their secchi disc. <laughs> And they are very proud of their secchi disc readings. Um, some other oligotrophic lakes are um, Blue Lake south of Hazelhurst. And there's two basins on there. But on the west basin, they usually get about 25 feet. And those are oligotrophic lakes. Um, so they're great for water skiing and tubing for those people who want to think in terms of recreation. And then as lakes age, Aquatic plants start to decompose. You get some muck building up. Uh, you get a little mucky bottom. Maybe wetlands start to encroach in there. And your secchi disc reading declines a little bit. And those are middle-aged lakes. They're mesotrophic. And Monaco and Coaga Saga are usually in that mesotrophic range. And then we have eutrophic lakes. And those are lakes that have uh, an abundance of phosphorus, maybe more algae in the water, but they have a tremendous plant population and a lot of diversity. And you can have really high-quality eutrophic lakes. And uh, some examples of those are Little St. Germain and Big St. Germain. Those are eutrophic. So their secchi disc reading is usually about 5 feet. Monaco and Quagasaga, usually 7, 8 in that range. So when volunteers go out and collect that that water clarity reading, they also collect the water color and the murkier clear, and then you can make the determination of what's impacting your water quality. If you have a secchi disc reading of 20 feet and it's blue and clear, you have an oligotrophic lake. Uh, if you go out and you have a secchi disc reading of 2 feet, murky green, then your, your secchi disc reading is impacted by LJ growth on the lake. I live in Price County. And our secchi disc readings, if you go out on Musser Flowage or Sioux Lake, is about a foot and a half or two feet. But it's brown and clear water. We have lots of wetlands in Price County. And a lot of that, those tannins are running into the lakes and impacting our secchi disc readings. So all of those things can be found out with your secchi disc reading. And maybe one secchi disc reading doesn't tell you a lot about your lake. But taken over time, it does. And that was kind of the idea with citizen lake monitoring, is that one volunteer would monitor for five or 10 years. They would retire. Another one would be trained and take over. And before you know it, um, you have this vast store of, of data. And for those of you who are interested, if you go to the DNR website and um, you go to the, the front page and type in lakes, the lakes page comes up, and on that page you can learn everything you need to know about lake maps and lake grants, but there's also a tab for citizen lake monitoring. So if you click on that, the citizen lake monitoring page comes up. You have 72 counties listed, and you can just click on the county, and then you can find out all the data that's been collected for that lake. And you can look at the actual lake summary reports that the volunteer has collected. There's a secchi graph over time, so you can look at that and, and try to figure out what's going on on the lake. And there's also a little trophic state gra uh, graph that tells you the trophic state of that lake. So the secchi, clear, or the secchi readings were going really well that first year. There were 129 volunteers trained, and they monitored 100 lakes in Wisconsin. They were mostly all trained by Carolyn. And then five years later, it was going so well that Citizen Lake Monitoring, or self-help, uh, decided to add some more monitoring opportunities for volunteers. And volunteers were asked to go out and collect water samples that they processed and then sent to the State Lab of Hygiene for analysis. And then the State Lab of Hygiene tells you the phosphorus level in your lake and the chlorophyll level. And those volunteers also take a temperature profile at the, the deep hole. 
And also, as Susan mentioned, we have volunteers who are out, who are out collecting native aquatic plant information. And then in the late 1990s, um, Laura Herman, who was our citizen lake monitoring uh, educator for Wisconsin, started a program where volunteers would go out on their lake and monitor for Eurasian water milfoil and curly leaf pondweed. And at the time, that was kind of a novel idea. Uh, we didn't have a lot of lakes with Eurasian water milfoil in them at that time. So volunteers were responsible for most of the findings of Eurasian water milfoil and curly leaf pondweed that we found. And since that time, we've expanded that. We've included Chinese mystery snails, banded mystery snails, hydrilla, rusty crayfish, spiny water flea, freshwater jellyfish, and unfortunately that list of invasive species is growing, so uh, we may be asking volunteers to do even more monitoring as time goes on. But um, they've been kind of the, the backbone of the partnership that Susan mentioned, and the data that volunteers collect is used to make management decisions. Volunteers work really closely with our lakes coordinators. We have seven or eight lakes coordinators throughout the state. And they work with the, the lake coordinator to make management decisions on their lakes. So for a lot of lakes who are working on lake management plans, volunteers become involved in collecting more information on the lake. And then they kind of act as a liaison between the DNR and Extension Lakes and the people back home on the lakes. Um, Nothing is more exciting to me. You were excited about your dragonflies, but when you're at a, a lake association meeting and a volunteer who's been monitoring for a long time stands up in front of the, the lake group and tells about the quality on the lake and whether water quality is improving or declining, and they're, they're able to bring all those lake residents into the conversation. And... Lake residents, for some reason, would prefer to listen to the volunteers on their lake rather than somebody from the DNR coming and, and talking to them. It's your neighbor and it's your friend and you trust them and it's a really good working relationship that we have. Uh, some other uses of the data that citizens collect, I don't know if any of you remember Mike Meyer. He's our, our loon researcher extraordinaire in the northern part of the state. And Mike has always been a great friend to Citizen Lake Monitoring. And he was probably the first researcher to say, I'm going to use citizen gathered data to make my research papers. And what he based his, uh, a lot of his re uh, loon research on was volunteer collected data. And he determined that, as you probably all know, loons are site feeders. So he did a, a rather extensive analysis of how they choose the lakes that they choose. And as you might expect, they're very fussy, but they choose the lakes. Oligotrophic lakes are chosen first. And then because the loon population is expanding somewhat, sometimes they have to settle for a, a mesotrophic lake or a eutrophic lake. But he based all that research on citizen gathered information. And one thing that Mike did find out was that if you were a loon, you would prefer to use a lake with a secchi discreeting of two feet that was stained as compared to a lake with a secchi discreeting of two feet that was impacted by algae. And uh, Noah Ladig works for Trout Lake, and he's up there. That's why I'm looking up there. Um, but he did a lot of research using citizen-based data as well. And then the DNR uses all the data that volunteers collect to create the impaired waters listing. And that's a, an indication of waters that are kind of going to be in trouble and have some issues as far as um, water clarity. And that list is developed using volunteer collected data. So since Noah is right here, he can tell you about his research. Thank you. Channel 4. There you got it. Um, yeah, thanks, Sandy. I, so I'm a research scientist at the Trout Lake Research Station. I'm going to come stand up here so that the folks online can see me talking. 
Um, and first, I have to say that the research that I'm interested in, the research that I do, wouldn't be possible without folks like Sandy and all of you guys that do citizen lake monitoring. It's critical for what the types of research I do. So I'm really interested in long-term patterns, what's going on over the long-term in lakes. And I'm interested in that in really large spatial scales. So I work for a long-term research program, and we monitor seven lakes up here. But I'm interested in thinking about regional to subcontinental scales. So really big scales. I'm working on like 17 to 20 state regions. Um, and so there isn't the capacity with folks in organizations, universities, or DNR to monitor that number of lakes. Um, however, if you think of all of you as citizens crowdsourcing data, all of a sudden there's a huge capacity to get a lot of data to essentially, in my dream world, is to monitor everywhere all the time. You know, every single lake has a monitoring record, and we can begin understanding how these lakes are changing across really big spatial scales, across long term, those sorts of questions. That's what I'm really interested in. And those types of questions aren't feasible to answer without citizens, really. We can get at them a little bit, but you need a lot of data. It's sort of the big data um, idea. You need a lot of data to begin answering those types of questions. Um, and so the type of work that Sandy's doing, the type of work that citizen science is doing is critical. Um, some of the more recent stuff that I've done um, was in eight state reg region, um, basically like Minnesota, Michigan, Wisconsin, Indiana, Ohio, um, the Heartland region um, of the United States is what it's called. We pulled together, um, and it was only citizen data, um, about a quarter million observations of citizen SECI. Um, if we narrowed that down, we talked about what was the average SECI in, on an, any given year. We had over 21,000 lake years. So um, for over 3,000 lakes. And so we were asking questions, how is water clarity changing across really big spatial scales um, and really long, long time periods? We had data back to 1930 um, was the earliest data. Most of our data was 1980 um, and newer. And what we found was that on average, um, lakes were increasing in water clarity. So the water clarity in lakes was getting slightly deeper. Um, on average, it was about 1% per year. Um, but and we only found significant trends in about 10% of the lakes. So 90% of the lakes just seemed to be bouncing along and doing their normal thing. About 7% of the lakes had significant increasing trends, and 4% of the lakes had significant decreasing trends. Um, and we're still trying to understand what's driving those trends. Um, the new questions that I'm interested in asking now um, is that, you know, we were specifically looking at was a lake increasing, was it decreasing, or was it staying the same? But a lot of times you can see really interesting patterns through time that aren't going to be linear changes. They're not going to be constant increasing or constant decreasing. You might have a really wet year or a drought or something like that that's going to cause these interesting cycles um, in water clarity. And so I'm starting to work with data mining scientists um, to use machine learning techniques to identify what the patterns are in lakes. And much of this research is driven by citizen science data. Um, and I, I just can't emphasize how important that type of data is um, for the type of research that I'm doing. Thank you. I just have a couple of uh, statistics for 2015. In 2015, we had 857 monitoring stations, and those are individual areas where a volunteer is actually collecting data. And we have 924 volunteers throughout the state. And since the program started in 1986, volunteers have collected 148,043 SECI readings. So then I started, because when you volunteer under a grant program, you're paid $12 an hour. So I started to try and figure out the value of self-help program by putting a monetary value on it. So I multiplied 12 times the 150,000 SECI readings, and then I got confused because I had to bring in chemistry monitoring, and then there was the invasive species monitoring, and I stopped when we reached $2 million. <laughs> so that's the value, that's the kind of the lowball value of volunteers to the state of Wisconsin. And uh, in the future, we hope to increase some of the monitoring opportunities for volunteers. Um, it may be things like, uh, and we're trying to look at lakes more holistically, and what happens on the land impacts what happens in the water. So maybe bringing volunteers in to count woody habitat in the water or look at 
uh, habitat throughout the lake and determine how the lake is doing as far as providing fish habitat or wildlife habitat. Um, volunteers have started doing lake level monitoring. Uh, that's particularly important in the Central Sands region. Some of those lakes are, are disappearing because of, well, they're disappearing. And I didn't want to go there. Um, <laughs> And uh, so those are some monitoring opportunities. We also have a water color thing that we're doing. We're trying to, there's a remote sensing program that the volunteers are involved in. They're taking satellite images and correlating the color of the lake to trophic state. And so there's just some ground truth going on as far as monitoring that way. So if you get a chance, go home. Um, if you're not familiar with who your lake monitor is on your lake, look it up and send them a little card and thank them. Or thank them here. <laughs> Won't that be nice? Give them a, Give them a oh. So there's a volunteer there. So, <laughs> and there's one over there. You can hug them on their way out. Earlier in your lecture, you mentioned about the phosphorus content and whether that indicates how eutrophic the lake is. Is that something that's man-made? Because I remember it as being an indication of the pollution that was being run off into the lakes. But the way you talked about it, it sounded like it might be a natural phenomenon. It can be a natural phenomenon and that whole eutrophication process that we were talking about can be accelerated by human activity. So um, when you put fertilizer on your property that has phosphorus in, typically it runs to the lowest point which would be the lake. And there's things that we can do that increase that phosphorus load that's going to the lake. So not having a vegetated buffer that kind of filters the water out and sort of pulls some of that phosphorus out before it dumps into the lake. So there's things that we can do, but there are natural sources of phosphorus as well. Uh, it's a dragonfly question. So <laughs> you had mentioned earlier about uh, the size of the dragonfly. Can you elaborate a little bit about why that size is you know, why they were so large at that time and then the decline? I can speculate. <laughs> uh, it, probably oxygen levels. Uh, there's uh, at least a hypothesis is that there were elevated oxygen levels and so you could have something that big because it would take a lot of energy to move something like that around. And so it was probably just elevated oxygen levels is, is the best guess. Okay, dragonfly question. Mm -hmm. uh, Sandy talked about lakes and quality of lakes. Explain how that affects the dragonfly. Yeah, and uh, and so some of the some of the other monitoring that we're doing, much like the Secchi, uh, because we're working in shallow water systems, we're using turbidity tubes, which is just a tube that has a little Secchi in the bottom. So we're also looking at water clarity. Uh, and then changes in water level because these these ponds uh, get a lot of stormwater input. They can be very flashy, and so some of what we found is that uh, water clarity seems to matter uh, quite a bit for species that have uh, the the naiads or the immatures that are primarily visual predators. So, like that common green darner, they have huge eyes. And so a number of the dragonflies, the immatures, uh, are primarily visual predators. And so they need relatively clear water uh, to feed in. We, we have one pond that it has, uh, I would guess, the equivalent of a secchi of less than a half meter. Uh, it's really low elevation. And we have only ever found one species of dragonfly in that pond, whereas we find 10 to 12 in the other ponds. About 15 years ago, I managed to flip a sailboat in the fall, lost my tiller, was in about 15 feet of water, and came back next spring, and we dove to find it. It had, it had the wooden handle on it, so it was sticking partway up in the air in the, in the bottom of the lake. 
what I found was there must have been 18 to 24 inches of floating mucky stuff. And one of my questions is, in, this, in the fall, there are a lot of hardwood trees up here. The leaves are going into the lake. People are blowing leaves into the lake to clear their waterfront areas. What is that doing to the lake? Is that OK that all this stuff ends up in the lake and going to the bottom and then ends up in the southeast uh, portions where the, because of the uh, prevailing winds? Well, there's a lot of micronutrients that are in the, the leaves that are falling into the lake and decomposing. And I know this because somebody called with this question. They were mad at their neighbor who was blowing the leaves into the lake. So I did some research, and I talked to our lakes coordinators. And, you know, leaves have been falling into the lakes for a long time. And I think that probably it does more damage for people to go in and rake the leaves out and expose that sand bottom or the rock bottom rather than just leaving them in there and letting them decompose. Um, Is that nutrient build up over time? Sure. But I think that you have to balance. When you think of a, a lake with, you know, 100 homes around it, and the impact of those homes on the lake compared to those leaves that are falling into the lake. I think it's all kind of a, a balancing. But Yeah, hi. Um, I'm glad you're here. I've had uh, all these questions for some time. It's about the Eurasian milfoil. And if they're monitoring the lakes, are, is there someone that's able to monitor the levels of chemicals? that they're using to treat the milfoil with. And then I have a, um, and on top of that question, is there a good map you can go to? Because we, we have access to the lake, and we realize <clears throat> when they work on a certain cove or something, they leave notes on the docks saying don't swim for two weeks. But we're out in the kayak or, or whatever, and we don't, can't see those notes. So we don't know where it's safe to swim because obviously, you're not supposed to be in the water for the first two weeks that they treat a certain area. And uh, so most importantly, are they able to monitor how much chemicals are being, um, you know, uh, absorbed by the fish, um, what lakes are being treated, and um, if there's a good map site or website we can go to. Volunteers have been involved in the residual monitoring, trying to figure out, a lot is not known about the herbicides that are being put into the water to treat your Asian water milfoil and curly leaf pondweed. So volunteers were involved in um, a process of collecting some of those samples from sediment and water samples to figure out how long that chemical lasted in the water column. And a lot of that was done in the Rhinelander office. Alex was, were you part of that? Tim, Tim was part of that, <laughs> sorry. Um, but that information is, uh, Michelle Nault kind of condensed that information. So those papers are available and I can certainly send those to you if you'd like to see them. What lake are you on? Oh, okay. And as far as what chemicals are used and the amount of chemical that's used, that is all available. That's public knowledge, and I can certainly help you to find that. And the map. The, A map that shows the lakes that are actively being treated? I'll, I'll jump in. Thank you, Carol. Yeah. <laughs> so part of that public knowledge that's who, that Sandy was talking about with uh, the amount of chemical, the kind of chemical, and where it's being treated, um, each permit that gets approved in the Northwoods has to come with a map. Then that map includes 
where exactly in the lake they're treating, whether it's the whole lake or just part of the lake. And it should also, it will also include how much Eurasian water milfoil or whatever plant they're treating before they treated and how much remains after it tr got treated. So if you contact the lake's biologist in the area, which Sandy could help you get in touch with, or any of us really, uh, all that information is there. there I, don't, I don't know of any map that outlines the whole area and marks each lake, but we have a record of every lake, every season that gets treated. Is there a website that has a kind of a list of all the lakes that have been treated in a year? Not that I know of. But we can help you on a regional level. Uh, I have a question that came in online. Um, this one is for Sandy. Uh, do Citizen Lake Monitors have to do all of the things you talked about, or can they just pick water clarity, for example? Or one other <laughs> no, we make them do everything. No. They can choose whatever they want to do. Water clarity monitoring is pretty simple and straightforward. We ask them to do it throughout the open water season and take a reading every 10 to 14 days if they're able. But as a volunteer, you can do it whenever you damn well want. <laughs> <laughs> so there. Okay, so you want to ask another one? I think we were going to have a couple. So I'll just ask one more, and then we'll turn it back to the brewery. Um, let's see. So uh, it seems like a disconnect between academia and citizens. What's a good way to find out about citizen science opportunities? That is a good question. Um, there is a, a relatively newly formed, I think it's about two years old, uh, national network called the Citizen Science Association. Uh, and they publicize a lot of opportunities. Uh, but, I, but I think one of the things that uh, is, is a gap is so many of them are grassroots level that uh, you know, like not a lot of people know about the dragonfly monitoring, for example. Uh, so I, I, I think they raise a really, really important question. Uh, hopefully, the Citizen Science Association, that network, will start providing some resources that will, will begin to organize things at, at a local level as well. And, oh, sorry. Uh, and there is a website, citizen-based monitoring, that tells about various uh, citizen monitoring opportunities throughout the state. So you can always check with that to find out. And they are having, sorry, our lakes, <laughs> our lakes convention is, the lakes convention is a partnership between the DNR and Wisconsin Lakes and, and Extension Lakes. And it's happening this year in March. And the citizen-based monitoring is kind of piggybacking on that convention time. So you can go to the Lakes Convention and then stay for another day and learn everything there is to know about citizen-based monitoring. Carol. Yes. <laughs> this is a, a dragonfly question. Um, I was never so grateful to see dragonflies. And like two, was it two years ago when we had a terrible uh, mosquito outbreak in the spring and there was no dragonflies and everybody's like where are the dragonflies and I was just wondering what triggers uh, you know the the trans transition from the uh, larval to adult okay so um, uh, they go through as as the larvae they go through uh, between 10 and 13 molts and so some of that is going to be temperature some of that is going to be food quality so if, if it's a relatively warm warm season, uh, and they've, they've got a lot of food, which at the early sizes, they start out with zooplankton, like Daphnia and copepods, and things like that. And then they start to move through to fly larvae, mosquito larvae, increasingly larger prey. So it, it would be mostly a combination of, for the larvae, for uh, food and temperature. But one of the things about the adults is if you go out on a, on a day that is uh, at least partly sunny, uh, maybe even partly cloudy, but I know for sure partly sunny. Uh, yeah, thank you for that. Uh, <laughs> I was working really hard. 
and, and winds that are about less than 10 miles per hour, so as long as it's not real windy. And if the, uh, if the air temperature is like 65 to 70, you'll see a lot of dragonflies flying around. If you go out on a day where it's cloudy, it's cool, and it's very windy, they're there, but they're hanging out in the, the grasses and the emergent vegetation. There's just such a risk to flying in wind and getting snagged by a bird. Uh, and also, they just have to work really hard. So part of it depends on, on the weather uh, at the time. Uh, and then part of it is going to depend on the time of year. Uh, they first begin coming out uh, in Wisconsin in uh, about April. So the, the naiads are moving to the shore, coming out, and then adults are flying about uh, with wings. And then uh, they fly into October about the first frost. Uh, there are a couple of species, and the common green darner is one uh, that migrates. So some of our, the big uh, green darners, they fly to Texas and Mexico and fly back. So you might, you might see, yeah, that's pretty cool. Who knew? Uh, and, and so you might see some coming back a little bit earlier before the emergence began. Uh, but I, I would suspect that there were probably dragonflies there, uh, just maybe not there at that time. Actually, there's two questions from the library. <coughs> Is there a list of citizen science project, projects or curriculum already going on in schools in Oneida and Vilas counties? Could you repeat that? Sorry. I'll try. <clears throat> Is there a list of citizen science projects or curriculum already going on in the schools in Oneida and Vilas counties? In schools? Mm -hmm. It's really hard to get schools involved in citizen lake monitoring because the monitoring is primarily done during the summer and a lot of schools aren't here yet. But we are trying to um, get schools more involved in looking at all those lake summary reports and looking at all the data that's been collected by volunteers. It's a really wonderful opportunity to use statistics and and you can work with lakes right in your backyard. Um, so the answer to the question is in Vilas and Oneida, we don't have much going on within the schools for citizen lake monitoring. Then another question from the library. Is there a list of citizen science needs beyond lake monitoring in Vilas and Oneida counties? Well, sure. <laughs> <laughs> right here, right. <laughs> we uh, can make one up. <laughs> uh, I don't know. <clears throat> well, there's, there certainly are lots of monitoring opportunities, you know, frog and toad monitoring, dragonfly monitoring, uh, the bird surveys. You know, the breeding bird surveys. Right, the sandhill crane count. Bats, oh, the bat monitoring. Oh, good, good. Yeah, and, and Bob, Bob Dubois uh, helped launch or launched uh, the Wisconsin Odonata survey. And so there are some real opportunities there. And, and rather than create something completely separate, we're just trying to plug into that as well. But, you know, with what we've done, uh, in southern Wisconsin, you know, my hope is that we can bring a lot of the curriculum that has been developed and developed by teachers primarily, we can bring that up here and then also start working with, uh, with the different monitoring groups. Uh, again, with the idea that there's a portfolio of opportunities rather than just a, a list of things that you have to do that's so overwhelming. Right. So I'm guessing they were kind of asking, like, is there a place on the web they could go and see what different kinds of monitoring is going on, like a, an overall list of, you know, they're monitoring bats here, here, and here, and they're monitoring. Oh, and they're here and I, here. I'm, I'm only guessing from the question, but. Well, certainly citizen-based monitoring, the website <coughs> would give you an opportunity to look at the different monitoring opportunities that are available to you. 
but um, I don't know that there's a list that would say, you know, they're doing frog and toad surveys here. And even for citizen lake monitoring, trying to figure out who's yeah. doing what and what lakes, it's somewhat cumbersome. We have a, a huge SWIMS database, and all of the data is in there, and it's available. It's just sometimes difficult to find it. We've heard from Wisconsin legislators that most lake residents do not play an active role in protecting their lakes that they do not voice their concerns with their legislators. How is this opinion possible when you have shared a tremendous effort on behalf of lake residents to take an active role to protect their lakes in the North Woods? <laughs> well, <laughs> I think the, the lake residents and the, the volunteers are sharing that information with lake residents and they're making I think we're all becoming more aware of how important our watershed is and water quality, and we all need to take an active part in that. And maybe it's a really time, timely question because there's, um, there's a lot of wetland issues that are currently being debated, and we all have the opportunity to voice our opinions and, and vote for whom we wish to see lead us. So did I answer the question? But the wetland issue, there's um, some shoreland wetland issues now that um, are particularly important that you may want to address. Write your legislators and your... Okay. I just want to... Um, point out that like up here, or at least in these northern counties, there's so many summer camps that are out on all the waterways that are sort of the summer version of schools in terms of having a network of um, citizen science um, monitors. Um, I work for Camp Manitowish in Boulder Junction. You know, we have 850 kids and 250 staff and they're all got science training in their background and, you know, why not? We'd, lo would, we'd love to do that, to be a market for uh, citizen science outreach and uh, monitoring. And we go to the same lakes every single year at the same time. And it's not a very difficult skill set. They'd eat it up. So it's just word. And then um, uh, I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about that SWIMS database, uh, what that means and what, what that is and what level of credibility it has and all that. Well, SWIM stands for the Surface Water Inventory Monitoring System, and I make fun of it all the time, but I shouldn't. Because when, we, when I first started uh, working with self-help, it was a, a really tiny little database that just had citizen data in it. And Jennifer Filbert is our database manager in Madison, and they've created this database that contains all water-related information, so the dream of the database managers is that you go, you click on Manitowish Lake, and everything comes up. You can get water quality information. You can get fish survey information. You can get all the grants that have ever been issued and, and the results of that grant work. And it would be all in this one location, plus all the aquatic plant monitoring information that we collect by point intercept surveys or volunteers collect. And so that's the dream, and it's a really wonderful opportunity. And we put lots of information into SWIMS, and the reason I make fun of it is because I don't know how to get the information out sometimes. <laughs> but I, I think we're, we're working on it, and Jennifer is wonderful. So, And as far as the, the kids becoming involved, not only can they do water clarity, but they can become involved in collecting native aquatic plants and creating herbariums on your lake. It would be a really fun opportunity for kids. You know how they love plants. <laughs> really? Wow. You should contact me. <laughs> okay. I got a question for each of you. Um, first of all, 
when our uh, gentleman does secchi readings and that type of thing on the lake every summer, he tells us whether the lake is more acid, base, or neutral. What correlation does that have on what grows in the lake and what doesn't? The other thing is about dragonflies. Okay. Um, there is a correlation between how many dragonflies hatch out and how many mosquitoes hatch out. There must be. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, do you find that more dragonflies hatch out in lakes, ponds, or rivers? What is the best environment for them? And I know the answer to this question because I actually watched it happen. How long does it take from the time the naiad walks out of the river bottom and flies away? How long does that take? Thank you. Go well, ahead. You, you go first because no, I'm going to have to think about this. Oh, I was thinking. Okay, okay, I'll go. Uh, so, um, so we tend to find uh, higher species richness, so greater number of species of uh, dragonflies in ponds, in wetlands, in smaller lakes that don't have uh, high fish populations. They, they do really, really well in fishless environments because uh, fish are one of the big predators on the naiads. Uh, and, uh, and, and then certain types of fish. So like green sunfish is just a dragonfly killer. Uh, it just goes nuts over dragonflies. So uh, certainly in ponds we have fairly high species richness. They, and dragonflies and damselflies tend to be more standing water or lintic systems, ponds and lakes, uh, than, than flowing water. Uh, there are uh, some species, like some of the club-tailed dragonflies, uh, they, the, the naiads live in sort of sandy substrate habitat. And then there are also uh, some of the damselflies, the, the jewel wings. Uh, where I grew up, those were actually called snake feeders. Um, and I don't know if that's a term that's used much around here. I haven't heard it much around here, but, but they were often called snake feeders. Uh, so not so much in rivers, uh, more, in, more in ponds, especially without fish, uh, and, and certainly some in lakes. One of the things about lakes is if it's got a, a pretty good uh, development of the littoral zone, the area that's got some sedges and rushes and cattails. Dragonflies need that. Many species of dragonflies need that as a habitat because they're ambush predators. They'll sort of perch and then dash out, hit prey, and then dash right back. Uh, so it's a refuge from predators. Uh, and then, let's see, you gave me a test. I can't believe you asked me a question that you know the answer to. Uh, <laughs> So, uh, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to speculate, how's that? Uh, I'm going to speculate that it, it takes them about an hour or two to crawl out of that old exoskeleton. And then it takes as much as 12 to 24 hours for them to develop their, uh, their uh, adult colors. Flying co there's, a, there's a phase where they look almost albino. The colors are kind of washed out. The muscles haven't hardened. The wings haven't hardened. That's called a tenoral phase. And that, depending on the species, is anywhere from 12 to 24 hours. And don't tell me how I did, please. You can. <laughs> yeah. Cool. So the volunteer, does he use a pH meter? We, within Citizen Lake Monitoring, we don't collect pH. Typically, it doesn't change that much, but if there are really dra are there drastic changes in the pH? No, not very much at all. But you know, it's it's a type of lake where it's clear water, but it's really tainted or tinted brown from a lot of streams coming in through sediment. Mm -hmm. acid base level stays pretty close to neutral. And is that 
like that in all lakes, or is it really diverse in other lakes? Okay, so your question is, does the pH of lakes change through time? Fertile lakes and non-fertile, you know, mm -hmm. does that have to do with acid or base? <laughs> you got a test too. <laughs> I don't like this test. Uh, I'll give it a try. Oh, Susan. Susan's good. Okay, so some of the lakes that are very brown, especially our bog lakes, tend to be acidic. So, so that is true. Um, uh, many of our lakes that are more eutrophic tend to be more alkaline. So they're going to be pH 7 and above. Um, s at least some of our lakes that are oligotrophic, not all of them, but some of them are going to be slightly acidic from neutral. Um, but generally, those numbers don't change a whole lot. Some lakes actually will change more over the course of a day than they will over the course of a summer. Um, so, um, but like Sandy said, we don't usually, it's not that easy to assess pH, especially in our lakes that don't have a lot of um, ions. Um, it, it's a it's a hard thing to measure. Thank you. Hang on, we need to ask questions using the mic. Okay, we really can't hear them. Thanks. We have a question back in the back. Um, my question is uh, about uh, reliable data that's being collected and uh, the training, maybe that uh, our volunteers that go through um, to collect the data. Um, say I was a land surveyor or a realtor and I'm trying to, you know, present this to someone else, how reliable is that data to pass on to somebody else, um, you know, with someone that's not, say, professionally trained or has, you know, gone out there, how, how would I be able to use this how data? Go first? Well, and, and I can tell you um, with with our particular project, the, uh, the turbidity tubes, that's kind of a no-brainer. Uh, the water levels, again, is pretty straightforward. The dragonflies, that was, that was the hard part. And so what we have set up now is that uh, to confirm an ID, you have to take a photo with a smartphone and then send us the photo. And so that way, then, people that do have the taxonomic expertise can do that ID. Uh, the field guides help get you really close. And so what I ask people to do is when they, when they send that to me is to give me the tentative ID. And that way I can see how close they're getting to what it actually is. Uh, and so that we do have a quality control built in within the, the photo. And with citizen lake monitoring, when I first started in 1997, um, a lot of people questioned volunteer collected data. And I think we kind of worked through that. And now there is a sense that the data is, is good data. We do have a quality assurance program in place. So with the water chemistry volunteers, 10% of the chemistry volunteers collect a blank sample and a duplicate. And we regularly, we do that every year as part of the, the quality assurance project plan. For volunteers who are doing aquatic invasive species monitoring, all of those specimens are verified. And for people who are doing native aquatic plant or collecting Eurasian water milfoil or curly leaf pondweed, those specimens are all verified by Dr. Freckman. He's the, our statewide kind of botanist. He's a... He's the person that we use to verify everything. So with the water clarity information, that's the only one that's really tough to do a quality assurance on. But we do have in place where all the data that volunteers collect is tied back to their volunteer ID number. And so through time, you can look at data and kind of clump it to a volunteer on a lake if you have a data set of 30 years or something. Okay, thank you. I'm going to quick jump in here. Um, this is Noah. 
There actually has been several scientific studies that have been done that have done side-by-side -side monitoring between citizens collecting data um, for SECI depth. Um, and professionals that are scientists collecting it side by side, and there's no statistical significant difference between them. Um, and so it's one of the great things about that monitoring technique is that it doesn't really matter if you're a citizen doing it or a scientist that's trained like myself or the folks that up on stage. Um, the quality of data and the numbers you get are virtually identical. Yeah, and one follow-up, one of the things that we piloted that I think is, is promising is um, so one of the one of the challenges is finding rare and common species. So if you know we've got some species that that we know are there, but they're just not very common. So you're gonna have to spend a little bit of time looking for them. And so we've had contests where then different species of dragonflies on the checklist have different point values, and things that we know that are uncommon have a higher point value. And so we get monitors to invest more effort in trying to find them. And the only incentive is I got more than you did. <laughs> Any back here? Uh, I just have two things. Um, summer before last, we do the all natural mosquito and tick spray. I tell you, if those dragonflies could hold off till July every year, we'd be in Florida every winter. I tell you, it was our best year ever for bug spray. <laughs> And then number two, um, does any do you know anything about the the whole uh, Solberg uh, water plastics division that was going to take off uh, up north by Manitowish Waters? If they okayed that for the plastics, uh, the water bottle thing oh, that was trying the, to be passed, the well. Yeah, I, they were going to take it out of some lake for bottled water. Yeah. Oh, that's on Carlin Lake, right. Was Can that you, ever passed or? Was that passed? No. Don't know. Okay. All right. Thank you. Sorry. She knows. Do you have a follow-up to that? I do. The plant was not cleared for, um, for it to take water from Carlin Lake. And um, the conditional use permit that the town board um, approved when it went to the county level, um, they, because in between those two points in time, when it was approved, they thought the water was coming from Carlin Lake. Um, once it was determined that they were not going to be doing that, the, um, I guess the town board is supposed to be meeting on that again. They have to reapprove the, the conditional use permit. Um, it has not been determined where that water is going to be coming from. And, I am actually one of the people who was wondering if they were to start taking the water from a well in, in Minocqua, um, if that would have any effect on the lake levels in the area. Um, it, I'm not sure if there's any data that um, has ever been studied in other parts of the region in the Midwest when a water bottling plant has gone in and they start pulling 1,000, 100,000 gallons of water a day out from you know, the water table or whatnot. Um, but I was also concerned about that because I was at the, the meeting and, and I've grown up here. So it's, I, I don't think there's enough, um, I don't think that they've done enough studies on that. And if they have, they aren't really talking about it. So anyhow, okay. if you have anything that you can add about that, that would be, Wonderful. I'm and not sure that's really the subject of And that's tonight, totally but. fine. I understand okay. that. I just thought right. but water. It would be a great topic for she another had... night. It would Fantastic. Okay. Thanks Thank a you. lot. Thanks for the comments. I'll just add one thing. Uh, we grew up uh, just south of Chicago, a town called Wilmington. Uh, a big company, Kraft Foods, they had a plastics division. And my concern with the whole water bottling thing they got going is whenever you uh, burn down plastics, you're going to have some kind of uh, contamination. And our, within our town, we had over 30 suicides due to the high arsenic level in the waters. And we had a lot of styrene and chemical poisoning. So that was my main concern. But my, my husband's waiting. So thank nope. you. Thank you. Any other questions?
questions on Citizen Lake monitoring? <laughs> how about how many mosquitoes does one dragonfly eat a season? Oh, good question. <laughs> wow. I don't know. Uh, yeah, that's a really good question. I, I know that with, uh, uh, with the, so they're going to, dragonflies, when they're the, the naiads, are going to be feeding on mosquito larvae, and then the adults are feeding on the mosquito adults. The adults, I don't know the feeding rate, uh, but I did spend a lot of time studying diets of the naiads, and so in 24 hours, they would probably eat anywhere from 15 to 20 larvae. Uh, wow. So, you know, and if you've got a healthy population of larvae out there, then they're going to knock them down. But, uh, you know, the adults, I mean, when they're flying around, they're also feeding on the wing, and so they're not stopping to munch. Uh, so I'm guessing they're snarfing down a lot. Any other questions? Okay, well, thank you very much, everybody. We've had a tremendous evening. Thank you, Sandy Wickman, and thank you, Robert Bohannon. Thank you.